Hi, I'm Fred Serval, and you're watching Homo Ludens, the channel on history and board games. Uh, one of my favorite games of 2022, which was released very late in 2022, but still within the year 2022, was Votes for Women, released by Four Circle Games, who were kind enough to send me a review copy. So uh, thanks, Kevin, for that. This asymmetric CDG about the political struggle for the 19th Amendment uh, took me by surprise by its elegance, but also its care for the history that it's depicting. For this reason, I'm very glad today to have uh, with me the designer, Tori Brown, to talk about this design, but also the history behind it. And here you are, Tori. Hi, thanks for being here. Hello, thank you for having me. I know it's, it's pretty a, late where you are, but I really appreciate it. It's completely fine. So that's uh, I'm I'm very happy to 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 have you there. And as we're not doing live stream, if I get uh, slower than usual because it's late, I can edit and sound smart. So that's uh, that's completely fine. But before we start, I'd like to know: Can you tell us a bit about yourself? So who is uh, Tori, the not game designer? <laughs> oh, who is Tori Brown? It's an excellent question. I am the designer of Votes for Women. I'm also a longtime political activist. I've worked my whole career in Washington D.C. on a range of unabashedly progressive causes, reproductive freedom, workers' rights on the side of the environmental movement. Um, you know, I see these fights and these struggles as connected, that the movements for a better and more just country and world are, you know, are, are one in the same. And whether you come at it from an environmental perspective, you come at it from the conditions we see at work, that they're all a part of creating dignity for people, no matter their class, their gender, their race. And so it's this work that I've done um, in movement building and in political communications that has given me such uh, deep experience and respect and love for the idea of movement building. And in, you know, thinking through previous movements, the suffrage movement really stands out. So it was just so fun to dig in and to learn more than I'd ever expected. I also, I've got a husband, I've got a couple of cats. Um, I like to travel. I like to do all the things that like people like to do. Yeah. Good. But cats is really important. We need to know those kind of things. I think it tells a lot about your design, but we'll go back to this. I have it here. I, I was wondering before actually designing this game, uh, what was your relationship with board games in general? When did you start board gaming? How important was it in your life? What kind of games actually got you excited about board gaming in general? I was a pretty normie board gamer, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, my family was a Trivial Pursuit family. I still mm. have a copy of uh, Trivial Pursuit Genus 2 that is one of my prized possessions. And then party games as um you know cards against humanity and apples to apples right that was just sort of like how we passed the time i think i started getting into sort of more what i would think of as hobby games you know a year or two before the pandemic um, i got a copy of watergate from my local store and that was a really interesting moment in sort of realizing that political storytelling could happen through a game and it could mm. be interesting and fun and oh, you get to be Nixon you're like -ha -ha -ha. he didn't have a mustache but I could see him twirling a mustache like a classic villain um you know Carcassonne Ticket to Ride are also just sort of like fun games to pass some time when I'm not watching movies or sort of the prestige TV of our moment so I would I you know went now having met so many gamers very light very sort of um blasé about it but it, it's going through this process both the design and the launch and the reaction of Votes for Women has absolutely changed uh, my relationship with games and I spend a lot more time playing and thinking about games now. Okay but that's really interesting and yeah it's clearly a, a normie background but I think it, it's great because it's we get people into gaming through those games and I think that it's really a, a testament to the success for me of, of Watergate that someone who's not really into gaming would play this game and realize the potential of games to talk about history. And I think that beyond being a great game, I think that as a design, it is a beautiful design. But I also think it is great to have reached that wide an audience and show, you know what? Games can be a pretty decent medium to talk about history, which is, which is, which is something that I think is an amazing achievement by Matthias Kramer. So that's, that's really interesting. And in defense of Normie games, I love Normie games. Uh, I still play Carcassonne. And uh, you know what? One of my favorite games is Exploding Kittens, which is a game that is widely hated on the internet because it's supposed to be random, stupid, and everything. And you know what? 
with the right people, if you have good friends, any game is awesome. So, <laughs> so that's the thing. With a good beer, with a good friend, exploring kittens is, is amazing. Not everything has to be uh, 25 pages of rules. So that's, uh, so that's fair enough. But it's really interesting that you have this background and then you came up with something that is so clearly within, I would say, the... Um, so ingrained uh, in 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 the in the war gaming culture uh, because when you play votes for women you really feel like the the lineage to uh, Twilight Struggle to 1960 making of a president and all of those things so that's uh, that's a, that really comes through really powerfully but we'll go back to that there is one last thing that I would like to talk about just to to better understand also your uh, your vision of the game and how you came to to design this game is. What, I, what I'm wondering about is, especially because it's your first game, why did you want to make this game? What was your purpose? What was your intent behind it? What actually was the driving force that made you put so many hours in making a game like this? I know it's a lot of efforts. It's it's not a sprint. Like It takes a really long time with the whole production process, the frustration sometimes, the anxiety that comes with it and everything. What, what made you go through all of this? Why did you... <laughs> Why did you impose this on yourself? <laughs> <laughs> what kind of masochist would? Yes, exactly. <laughs> I think you know. I think about it from a couple of different angles or directions, and the idea that movement builders, political people, we you know, people who want to see a more just world, I think need to be creative need to think outside the box about how we are reaching new people and how we are building our own movement. If you've noticed in America, <laughs> there's still a lot of people that don't really jive with dignity <laughs> and with justice. Um, they have their own ideas about it. And we, as uh, at I, you know, in my thinking as progressives, need to do a better job of reaching new communities and engaging folks in a way that isn't just about tweets and protests and throwing paint around, right? Like I think all of these activist tools are important, but they're not sufficient. And the idea that a game can communicate not just a history and an education about what happened, but a path forward and communicate to players that joining together, that being a part of a movement and a group of people that care and are deeply committed to these issues is not just like a good way to get things done, but possibly the only way to get things done. You know, really, I saw the power of games to bring new people into the fold. So that was like sort of a, a big piece that sort of expand the political communication, outreach and targeting. The, the other side of it was to help gamers think about subjects that could be interesting topics and themes and to help expand the the stories that are told and what feels like appropriate titles and compelling narratives and to say to folks that care deeply about this hobby and um, this sort of craft of game making that we can we can tell different stories there's not just wars and in sort of violent conflict, but there is nonviolent conflict, there's struggle, there are movements that have great narrative arcs. And that by thinking differently about what games are and can be, we can then bring new people into the fold and that more people might want to join and buy games. And so it's a sort of self-fulfilling, self-feeding machine that new games bring new people in and then our hobby grows and is more interesting and reflective of a broad lived experience rather than a sort of very narrow band of um, ideology or you know kind of violent conflict. Th that being said, th th there was violence in the suffragist movement, right? Yes, so the American movement did not have the same kind of tactical mm. bombings and right and, and it was a, it was a schism frankly there are a lot of schisms in the movement represented in mechanics of the game but in general American suffragists disavowed the kind of violent militism that we saw in the UK and they distinguished themselves they were sort of embarrassed by that kind of unladylike behavior some suffragists who came over to the UK and were part of some of this movement building came back and brought some of these tactics uh, but they would stand silently in front of the White House while men just lost their mind and then they were taken political prisoner they were force-fed they were beaten it was more of the violence came from the state's reaction 
to the suffrage movement than was instigated by the, the American suffrage movement itself. And now that we start talking about the history, I would like to focus on the game and focus specifically on the history. Uh, and we started touching upon it, but could you give um, at least a brief historical context of what your game is depicting? So based on this, we can then talk about the design and reflect on, on how this history is portrayed within the game. Sure. So the nominal start of the American suffrage movement is the Seneca Falls Convention. Work had happened before that. People that did work decades later didn't really see that this was very meaningful in their life and their activism. But as far as the story of suffrage goes, this has been the sort of like declared starting point and just made an easy narrative bridge um, for the game. So the game starts in 1848 in Seneca Falls, where you know the first sort of major declaration of women deserve the right to vote was um, was made, and. From 1848, it progresses through um, the game deals with three eras of, of the, the history. We move through the Civil War, which was a huge, I guess you could say, bummer for the suffragists. It was hard to get a lot of stuff done while the country is tearing itself apart over slavery and, and um, chattel, you know, sort of the you know, ownership of human beings. And from there, we see the uh, movement really move out west as uh, new states are territories are becoming states states are um, enfranchising women it, it's very uneven in the united states it's not just in one fell swoop in 1920 women got the right to vote it was inconsistent it was based on location it was based on race we see you know major speeches we see stunts we see different strategies whether they focus in congress to try to get an amendment passed whether they focus on the courts and try to sue their way to enfranchisement or try to organize in states um, you know, all of this is sort of you know in competition there's not just one movement for suffrage there are many through the 1900s the sort of gilded age the progressive era of american politics again as um, states are coming online as people are starting to understand the concentration of wealth and power is a very damaging thing to American society. Uh, we get to the sort of late 19, you know, 1910, there's some uh, the last sort of last decade of suffrage in the lead up to World War One, where, you know, all throughout women are redefining their role in American society. They're not just sort of property of their husbands, they're becoming full fledged people and respected as such. And the rights are slow to catch up. But consistently throughout this whole period, women are organizing and men too, for these rights, for this recognition, for this capacity to be involved and to govern themselves, which was sort of very clearly part of the original American Revolution. And that uh, the, the 19th Amendment is uh, sent to the states in 1919. You know, Article 5 of the Constitution and who doesn't, it required two thirds of Congress to pass and then three quarters of states to ratify the 19th Amendment. And finally, after much consternation and organizing and work, the, the suffrage amendment was ratified in Tennessee, it's the 36th state, on August 20th, 1920. And some women had the right to vote. Um, and, you know, so what happens after that is, you know, uh, continued struggle, continued organizing, uh, continued work on behalf of Black women, of Chinese women, of Native women. Um, but the 19th Amendment as a piece of, you know, like never had a group of Americans without mm -hmm. the vote <clears throat> assert their rights to vote. And it's really a remarkable feat. It was messy. It was sometimes super racist and is incomplete, but it's still a feat unto itself. Is there um, a couple of books that you would recommend for people uh, listening to this interview to maybe go a bit further to better understand the, the struggle for, for obtaining the, the, the right to vote in the U.S.? Sure. I think um, Ellen Carroll Dubois' Suffrage is a great book. I find she's a tad apologetic for the racial animus that some suffragists held. She's, you know, puts them squarely in the context of their time and that this was just how people thought and why would they have thought anything differently? When history shows us that women did think differently, black women certainly mm. thought differently and we're saying very clearly, uh, but it's still a great and comprehensive look. I think a good companion to suffrage by Ellen Carol Dubois is uh, recasting the vote that talks specifically about women of color and their work in the suffrage movement. Um, it goes through you know, native women who were organizing not just for the right to vote, but the right to be citizens and not um, wards of the state as the United States had a very terrible relationship with the native people on its 
land. And Asian women, the Chinese Exclusion Act and the way that um, that Chinese women were excluded from citizenship, as well as Black and um, La uh, Hispanic or Spanish speaking women. So recasting the vote is a really nice, right, sort of companion piece. And I think those two books are really interesting. I also really liked New Women in the Old West. Again, such a big part of the early suffrage movement were states like Wyoming and Utah and, and stuff, you know, out West that were giving women a new opportunity to take on roles in society and towns. They were, you know, taking responsibility inside the home and outside of the home. And, you know, there was organizing to, you know, sort of receive the right to vote in um, in relation to that. And also that the vote could be something that would attract women to these mm -hmm. new states as they were, you know, sort of overpopulated 10 to one in some of these states by um, men, you know, a men to woman ratio, which is just not the, the numbers you need for a flourishing society. So, you know, it was both a reward and sort of award um, to try to flesh out these sparsely, parse, sparsely populated by white people yeah. areas of the United States. Now I'm talking specifically about the game, not the context around it. There is something that I think is quite unique about it that I really loved in it when I opened the box, and that's the reproduction of historical documents. So I think it's, a, it's an amazing idea. I don't know why anyone had the idea before, but this is such... So I have a few examples here. So uh, you have this. There is also this article of the, the New York Times where it actually reproduces the whole first page of the newspaper, I believe. Uh, it's a composite of the coverage yeah. from the day that the suffrage amendment passed in 1920. There's some ads, there's some like historical context, there's the story of what's happening in Tennessee. It's all so good. And, and there is so much there and it brings so much into the immersion and understanding and, and feeling like uh, a feeling of the era. But also I think when you open the box and you find this, it reminds the player that they are not just playing a game, but that they are interacting with history. It's something that is trying to convey something about the um, the event that is being depicted, which is, I think, is really a, a great idea. What gave you this idea and how did you choose those specific documents? Because, of course, you must have had so many things that you could share and you picked those. You picked quite a few. So that's uh, so maybe it was hard to choose. But uh, <laughs> but uh, how, did you, how did you make it with this with this specific choices? So... The historical reproductions are a Fort Circle ethos. In the previous game that Fort Circle, my publisher, um, put together, Chores of Tripoli, includes a letter from uh, Thomas Jefferson to I don't know, somebody in the in the Mediterranean in Libya now. And you know the the letter is very polite. It has very sort of like flowery language, but it is like we're coming and we're gonna like bust you up, kind of if you you know keep messing with our ships and these pirates. So Kevin, my publisher. You know, this was all you know part of the deliverables, right? It wasn't just the research, the design, the edited the designer notes. It was also you know historical documents. And I think he asked for like three or five. He's like, give me a few. And like there is more than three or five I, so for the people who don't have the books. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I when I was doing research for the game, I had a spreadsheet that sort of became the basis for all of the cards. And each of those cards has a, you know, a piece of individual artwork on it, whether that's a photo, a painting, a primary source document, whatever, you know, they're all, they all they sort of span the gamut of, um, of sort of artwork on the cards. I was also keeping a, a bunch of Dropbox folders of all these different artworks from archives, from state um, you know, history, outfits and the library of congress and all these different places and the picking was very was very hard obviously um part of it was the idea of spans the the time period so that helped sort of narrow things down right like what's something very early what's something like the um not just the new york times coverage but there's also the um stamp or the uh the voter registration card came from the the deciding vote in Tennessee, it's his mom's uh, voter registration card. So it even goes a little bit after the 19th Amendment was uh, was ratified. I wanted it to focus, there had to be some opposition, right? The opposition is a big part of this game and a big part of what the game is trying to convey. So there needed to be, you know, there's some postcards and some letters opposed to Emmeline Pankhurst in there. They needed to have sort of different sizes and feels. There's a telegram that is exposing the rift on how Black women are treated in the movement that was very important for me to add in because that's a part of this story as well, this racial rift and the way that this whole movement is racialized and was taking place in a racialized country. So 
there was like colors and sizes and authors and purposes wanted it to sort of cover this range. And I think Kevin was a little dubious that we needed 14, but mm -hmm. it has the reaction, the reception to these documents has been overwhelming. People, it really does help people pull in. I think it's part of what makes Votes for Women a more emotional experience than I even expected as I was designing and putting cards together. People have a real visceral reaction to this game. And I think the um, the documents are a part of it, that it felt immersive and it felt not just like living history, but that they you could feel you know like a newspaper, like a letter. These are still, th newspapers still exist and so do letters. And it feels there's a sort of timeliness to it that I think people are, pulling it into their everyday lived experiences rather than just seeing it as, you know, relics from a past era. But I think it's it's really interesting. And also like those small bits that you were talking about the the telegram oh, here, yeah. which it, it, it makes things very tangible in a lot of ways because it's as if you're hearing the people from that time speak like they were interacting with each other and everything. And so it's just legal documents necessarily, which I think is, 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 is really great. Uh, and Building up on that discussion, we were talking just before I started the recording about the importance of iconography for you in the in the work that you put in into the design. Is that something that really shines through the cards? And can you tell us a bit more about that? Why it was important for for you? The research phase lasted a while. So did the design phase. It all lasted a very long time. But the research phase, like I said, you know, there's this spreadsheet that I start building out, and in my mind, I see the sort of card and the card layout and you know a title a description right then there's room for card text right what does this card do and there's uh, event text and the artwork and the as I'm pulling together the the art um, and looking at different photos and um, paintings and primary documents I think you know I wanted it couldn't all just be black and white photos it couldn't all just be document, you know, typed out documents or handwritten letters. It really needed to, as you are flipping through the cards, as you are pulling out a card, you know, cards in your hand, that you are getting different, right? That there's the diversity of medium and diversity of, um, of color palette that make it, I think, visually kind of engaging. And so, you know, gathering that art and choosing it, you know, I, I had a, a fight with my public, oh yeah, we had lots of discussions, uh, my publisher and I, and um, Jeanette Rankin, who is a congresswoman from Montana, she uh, is, there's a, a, a portrait of her that's painted and it's a beautiful picture. Um, I had found a, a picture of her from um, when she was at Radcliffe, when she was in college. And in that picture, she's young and vibrant and just like it's a, a side of her that I had never seen before before going through these archives. And you know, we went back and forth. We ended up using the portrait of her. It helps break up a bunch of the different photos. You know, it creates some difference in the deck. But I still do love that picture of her. So yeah, and we think of a lot of like I think a lot of these suffragists as older women, you know, especially, you know, as cameras weren't so relevant, not everybody had access to a camera in, you know, 1880s, that having pictures of these women as young and thoughtful, I thought was really important. I think we went with the visual, um, we went with the, you know, this beautiful painting of her. It's not, you know, it's not a bad picture because it helped break things up. And maybe just one last thing about the iconography. There is, in my mind, a real power move in the deck, which is the start card for uh, the opposition, which is the patriarchy event card that uh, uses a painting of the Second Continental Congress, which is something that is, I guess, really important in the uh, imagination of, of, um, of U.S. patriots. Uh, what message did you want it to convey through this? Because when I saw it, uh, I remember I was playing with a friend called Luke and we, we actually laughed when we saw it. Like, like we, 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 but like it was a positive laughter. We're like, that's, that's really a power move. And we thought it was great, extremely interesting, very, uh, uh, like a very strong statement. But I was wondering, what did you want it to convey? And also what kind of reaction did you get? Because I guess that, that must uh, rough a few feathers, I guess. Yeah, not, it's not without controversy. Um, it's actually, I think, something that came through in playtesting. A bunch of people who playtested Votes for Women had playtested Shores of Tripoli. You're sort of, I guess, we'd say like mainline war gamers, um, older white American men. 
And there was some real stiff reaction to, to the beautiful painting of the Continental Congress. And that, you know, if not for Jefferson and the Continental Congress, then none of these suffragists would have ever gotten any rights. How dare you call them the patriarchy? This kind of stuff, right? Like there were some like real, not mean, but like just people did not understand. So the game in my designer notes includes a mini essay about why I used that picture. And essentially when Elizabeth Cady Stanton in 1848 is at the Seneca Falls convention, she drafts a declaration of sentiments and it is word for word, beat for beat, like the um, declaration of independence and the through line, right. But what happened at the continental Congress was radical, right? It was revolutionary. It was shocking that these people could just declare themselves independent and create a government out of it. And what happened in Seneca Falls was similarly radical and revolutionary, that women would declare themselves part of this country in a political outspoken way. And so that through line um, from Jefferson to Stanton, from the Declaration of Independence to the Declaration of Sentiments was important. And the Continental Congress was given opportunities. They were reminded to include women and to think about George as a tyrant. And as Abigail Adams said, all men would be, ty could, would be tyrants if given the opportunity. And John, as far as we can tell, ignored Abigail. And I think it's important to remind folks that we have opportunities in our lives to listen to people around us and to be a better version of ourselves. And in this one instance, you know, what was revolutionary and radical was insufficient and that we continue to build on previous successes without, you know, like I said, the suffrage movement itself was messy and didn't include enough people. And so the work continued the Continental Congress and, you know, the work that our founding fathers committed was, was radical and insufficient at the same time that people were not happy. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But I, I guess they weren't, but I, I think it's a, it's a real power move and really interesting. And there is a, it's, it's a very strong point behind it, which is, which is really great. And what I think maybe uh, historical games should be thought provoking like this. So, so I think in that regard, it's a, it's it's awesome. Looking specifically at your design, uh, there is an element that blew my mind, but also as a designer myself, is that you came up with this idea of having one faction, the suffragist, that has two colors. And it is such an elegant way to show the complexity of how do you use composited uh, movements to create a general political movement through a specific uh, that aims for a specific goal but it's not a monolith this idea that a faction is complex uh, has internal division has different ways of doing things we we're talking about the differences between the suffragists in the uk and in the us for example and this idea of just having very simply the opportunity to have two different colors and have campaigners that are going to be of different colors and events that are going to target one or the other I thought was like really great at showing this because you can still be a player and still have to manage the complexity of your movement. How did you come up with this idea and why was it important for you to show potential diversity within a single faction? The story of suffrage that I learned growing up was one of simplicity and one of there were these women, they were all white, they were all middle or upper class and they got the right to vote, right? And so doing the research and diving in, it's much more complex and, you know, sort of scratch the surface and it becomes instantly clear, you know, as the 15th amendment is being ratified in the United States that enshrines the right to vote for men only and defines voting as for men. There's this big divide and that's in the wake of the civil war and in enfranchising black men who heretofore had been in many places property. Right. And so the divisions of, um, of suffragists and, and you know, sort of as a result of we support the 15th Amendment and um, we think that having black men as voters will be helpful for our cause. That's creating more, you know, sort of like minded folks that will be supportive and will vote for people who would vote for women's suffrage versus what became kind of like really nasty racist of like, why should a black man get to vote when I'm an educated white woman? This like creates this big divide. They name themselves the American Women's Suffrage Association, the National Women's Suffrage Association. They you know, have competing theories and they sort of go back and forth. And eventually, you know, they sort of stall out on both sides and come back together. But we see again in the 1910s, these divisions and, you know, divisions over um, 
whether you know we should focus on the states and just go state by state. You know, a lot of these kind of racist white women in the South wanted a state by state strategy where they could ensure that only white women were allowed to vote in their state, um, and they didn't want the federal government interfering. Right, so the states' rights argument that's a mask for um, some really terrible stuff versus the sort of federal movement for this national blanket amendment. Um, so the divisions are sort of all over the history of suffrage. So it was just sort of clear that that was going to be a part of the game, right? That these divisions would be um, part of it. The purple and the yellow or traditional American suffrage movement uh, colors, there's like, I don't know, purple for loyalty and yellow for sunshine or something. I, you know, I'm not really a big like, color theory kind of gal. And so that sort of became clear that that was easy to sort of depict them purple and yellow. And then it became about these sort of card factions. And, you know, when I'm teaching the game to people, there's always this like, oh, purple and yellow, does it matter? And I have to like, do I tell them it matters? Do I let them find out for themselves? Because it absolutely matters that the um, the opposition deck has the opportunity to remove all yellow from any three states or to take purple from all states, that kind of a thing. So you have to balance your power across the states with these various colors. And, you know, as it also, it helped for two, or it was like, you know, when we go to two player cooperative, it becomes one's the purple player, one's the yellow player. Th like this, like it tells a story, it creates opportunity to play in different functions. It, you know, certainly gets embedded through the cards um, and the gameplay and the way that these divisions harm, um, you know, the suffrage player as their suffrage players, as they're trying to, to get the job done. You know, it just, it felt like, the game wouldn't tell the right story without the ability to either pit the sides against themselves or to for the um, opposition to exploit the divisions and to pick off based on one side didn't like what the other side was doing or you know you could always sort of paint them with the most radical brush yeah. um, and so that you know it sort of it was a mechanic that needed to happen. Um, to tell the story and to make the game work. And you touched a bit upon it, uh, talking about the two, the fact that um, two players can play the same faction. There is something that I thought was really interesting in the game is how plastic it is when it comes to player account, but also how you can interact with the game. You can play alone. Uh, you can play two co collaboratively against an opposition bot. Uh, you can play 1v1 in a very traditional fashion, 2v1, 2v2. Why was this important to you and how did you manage to make everything work? Because, I mean, it's a wide player count and it's actually kind of a lot of ways to interact with the game. And it feels like the game is not really fragile. It's taking it and it rolls with it and that works. But but right. how, how did you come up with, with, that, um, with that idea? So it was built 1v1 and that's my favorite way to play. Like, you know, in my mind, it's a two player game and, um, you know, one person playing opposition, which is not popular, I guess, and one person playing suffrage. But I think it's a reflection of how people play games and that, you know, it, especially the oppo bot that lets people play alone, right? Like, not everybody has someone that wants to play with them and they still want to have a nice time. And so once the, the opposition deck was finalized, then you could use that as a starting point for the oppo bot. And it's slightly smaller. The rules are a little bit different and there's different text uh, because you use uh, die to sort of do the strategic planning on the oppo side um, when you're using the oppo bot. And so once then, the oppo bot was in um, was in working shape you know, for a solitaire game. Then it became pretty easy to sort of make some shifts on the suffrage deck for making it work as a two player against oppo. And you can split the oppo bot as well, um, so you could theoretically do four, you know, two v two. Although it really is just a sort of splitting of these turns, right? A suffrage player holds three cards, and the uh, one suffrage player holds two cards. One suffrage player holds three cards, and you can do some. Um, discussion back and forth mm. um and it's i think you know like i said a recognition of how people play games i think the idea that the two versus oppo bot right this cooperative game um or p way to play the game is i think i didn't realize how important it would be because so many people are opposed to playing opposition yeah. Um, and so that sort of took me mm -hmm. by surprise that that would be you know a real popular way to play the game 
Yeah, and that's also something I wanted to to to, to talk about. Was it did you did you do it for that reason? Did you expect that people wouldn't want to play the opposition? But you were saying that it's a surprise to you that yeah, that yeah. That, that that does make sense. Yeah. Yeah, I think the uh, the oppo bot was mostly sort of created for a solitaire version yeah. of the game, and that then we could also right, and especially based on player feedback of like people just not wanting, you know, it, I've heard all these. It feels gross to play opposition. It feels bad that people have this like. I mean, I, you know, like it's playing playing Nixon on um, in, uh, in Watergate or. Yeah. Lots of games where Nazis are, you know, a faction and a part of the right, like the set right in Civil War games. Somebody plays the South. Even people who you know haven't ever seen the game, you know, I've seen comments on you know reviews and things saying, "Oh, I would never play opposition. Why would anyone ever want to play opposition?" Um, I just I sort of naively assumed that people play games and know that it's pretend and don't feel like they have to hold the emotional contents yeah. of the, but people at, you know, it, some of it I think is current American political context. Some of it is, you know, that, you know, Nazi games are really abstracted, right? You're not like a Holocaust game. It's a battle line game. And so you don't have yeah. to think about what it means to be a Nazi when you do an opposition have to think about what it means to want to deprive women of citizenship it's a lot more personal as well right you know a woman and the thought of taking her right to vote away or never giving it to her in the first place um i guess it makes sense but i still you know play as pretend and we have a lot to learn and if we want to overcome opposition and backlash which we see time and time and time and time again to social movements understanding a little bit and thinking through that these are real people and not just monsters under the bed or um, people that are against their self-interest um, you know i think it's helpful and important to mm understand opposition and i think playing opposition in what votes for women starts that conversation yeah it's a really interesting point um and i'm always a bit uh, uh worried when when people become too picky about playing a side i think it's it's important to acknowledge that history is not clean and uh, you need also to understand uh, what the other side uh, what was their way of thinking and in a lot of ways if you want to like understand and in a position to combat this i think uh engaging with it is probably useful whether you you like it or not even if those are just games but i think it's still like having that open-mindedness so towards well it's not because i understand them that i agree with them it's just so i just want to understand the the, the thinking behind it um, and people say like they're really surprised when they play opposition like oh yeah. I, I never thought about how women were opposed to the right to vote like it's just they yeah. never like and we don't do a very good job in America of telling a story about mm. opposition about the industries that were worried about women organizing whether that yeah. was liquor or right textiles and all these sort of different um, you know moneyed interest involved but that women felt in a self-interested kind of way that voting would be bad that upsetting the apple cart of their privilege and what they saw as their right to sort of rule a domestic sphere um, would be bad. Like they had their own self-interest that I don't agree with. And I think if you don't want to vote, then don't. People are surprised um, as they play the game, the sort of nuances of opposition. Yeah. And I think you do a better job of understanding that, playing that side. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And regarding the process of making the game, so I usually say that making a game is a collective effort. You cannot really make a game on your own. No. Uh, and in that collective effort, you had the chance of working with one of the masters of the card-driven games, uh, Jason, Jason Matthews. Matthews. Yes. And I was, I'm going to say, and I hope he won't be upset about it. And if he's upset, it's too bad for him. But for me, it was for women killed 1960 making of a president. Like after playing it, I was like, ah. I'm happy Never. with this one. I don't need the other one anymore. But how was it working? How was it working with him? Jason's wonderful. He has a very dry sense of humor. And so you yeah. got to like move through. He is so smart and had so many ideas and just the, the conversation about if then, if what, right? Like, you know, the way that the cards do such a wonderful job of chaining themselves together, right? Playable if, if um, Civil War is in effect or, you know, some of the thinking on the Southern Strategy card and how that really wallops people. Really, it, that those kinds of conversations were just invaluable in being able to, I think, take the game to the next level. And I think also then how, you know, uh, the 
the rule book came together, you know, being very precise, very clear, I think we're able to take some of Jason's thinking about what was necessary and what was extraneous from 1960. Um, also, I would like to say that Article 5 of the Constitution that gives the sort of simple state mega majority is so much better than the Electoral College. It is such a like much simpler, um, better system than, um, you know, electoral votes and how in 1960s uh, math sort of works out. So I lucked out on that. But working with Jason was great. And he's been just a super proponent. He helped organize a war game Wednesday speaking opportunity at our local game store labyrinth. He's someone who cares deeply about the community and bringing in new voices and um, was just super helpful. Mm. And, and talking about the community, how was the reception to the game so far? In general, broadly speaking, it's been amazing. I think there are, you know, different factions of of the the hobby and lots of folks are hungry for new titles are supportive of new voices you know want to see women and folks you know who have not necessarily been represented in successful titles have a shot right like at least sort of get a chance. Um, and a lot of folks have just been you know great you know, David Thompson is someone that comes to mind of every title you can imagine, um, who's just been um, super outspoken about how much he loves to play it with his daughter and how much he just loves it as a game. Um, so by and large, folks have been you know, asking me to come on podcasts. The reviews have been mostly really solid. It's mostly been really nice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what's coming next. Uh, but I warned you ahead of time. <laughs> so historical gaming, um, and more specifically war gaming, because the way that I like to frame it is that we have an ensemble that is historical gaming and a subset of this is war gaming. It's a very masculine part of the board gaming hobby. Oftentimes, I would say pretty conservative. I would say that the estimation that we have based on different uh, surveys that have been done through the years, but also experience at conventions and everything, that less than a couple, maybe less than a percent of war gamers or women. How do you feel about this as a designer entering that part of the hobby? And is your experience that this specific uh, community has been welcoming to women? And if not, what could be done uh, to change the fact that less than a percent of war gamers are, are women? Yes, I have noticed um, the very um, non-diverse uh, demographics of war gaming. I think for some people, war gaming is a bit of a safe space. It's an escape from day-to-day -day responsibilities, escape from having to be around women and think about what it means to not be a misogynistic butthead and that it's just a, an opportunity to be around people like them, right? Which is, I think, why Wargaming seems to have been so full of people like them, right? They sort of self-select in and make it kind of difficult to get out. I, I, I see comments um, you know, there'll be a, a blog post, a review that says, oh, there's all this chatter that this isn't, you know, this isn't a war game, that, that women should stay out of it, that I don't like, this isn't right, worthy of our time. I don't, I don't see a lot of that. A lot of that, I think, is happening in Discord servers and closed Facebook groups, right? There's a sense, at least a good sense, that like, this is not how we should be talking anymore, that this is for us and like everyone else needs to get out, right? But it is still happening in these contained spaces and I'm seeing sort of echoes of that. I think some of the you know, organizations that award recognition to war games either aren't really sure about what to do with Votes for Women or have outright decided that it is not a war game and does not deserve to be a part of the community and part of an awarding ceremony. Um, again, these are all happening in closed doors, right? In places, you know, I don't know, back rooms and smoking cigars or whatever, you know, the, the sort of cliches of it. I think if people want war gaming to survive and to flourish in the coming century and decades ahead of us, that diversification is a must, right? People will age out. Um, there just will not be enough demand for publishers to create the kind of games that are interesting and viable and part of a sort of a thriving community. I think titles like mine, and I think hopefully pub other publishers see that you can make some of these sort of more complicated games mm. with a sort of really fascinating theme that has not been covered much, right? We, Emma Holland's The Vote definitely is like 
come before mine as a suffrage game. Um, but there's still, I think, a lot of ground in movement building. We have Taylor Shush's um, A Stonewall Uprising about the gay rights movement in the 70s and the 80s. I'm seeing these titles and you know, these different designers that are trying to tell different stories using this language of wargaming. And I think that that is a good indication of things to come. I think the more successful our titles are, just the you know, way that capitalism works will create more demand and more supply than hopefully for um, these kinds of games. But I, like I said, I think if, if this hobby is to survive and I hope that it does, I think it's so fun to try to like strategically out all of this stuff and to learn these new ideas and to live in history in a way that we can carry it into the present. You know, it needs, it, it you know, needs intentional activism. It needs folks to, I think, you know, it's not that, you know, I made a game and I'm a woman. Mm. So like, check me out. It's here's a game. It's a good game. Check it out, despite it being made by a woman. Um, and I think people watching or that are a part of the community can give titles a shot, um, can watch some reviews. And if you like a game, you can tell other people about it. Word of mouth matters a whole lot. Um, and you can be a part of support and promotion and advocacy um, to new designers with new titles and, um, and new ideas being spread. And then like buy things, like buy, it's capitalism, buy things. <laughs> um, that also is helpful, I think, in a sort of supply and demand kind of like publishers being aware kind of way. Just to conclude this, beyond now that you've released Votes for Women, that it's a great success. Uh, what is the what is the plans for Tory Brown, the designer? What are you planning on doing? Are you taking a break because it was a lot of work, but you're thinking about making something new and you already have something in mind, or this is it? I think it, there's like a brain bug that happens when you design a game and start sort of like diving into this world where things I see become mechanics how would that story work would it be tracks would it be on a board um, I have not been actively working on a project there's been a lot to do and conversations to have and events to to attend for votes for women and so all of my sort of extra free time when I'm not actually doing my day job um, have been focused on um, promotion for votes for women but there are definitely ideas cooking um, and you know I, think for me, this like movement game, telling stories from our past that can help us think about our future is super tactile. And like it's hard to like see around that. Um, I work in the labor movement and America's labor movement has been a, a story of, of violence and of loss and of overcoming incredible odds you know you could just focus i think on the farm workers organizing in california in the 60s mm -hmm. and how they drove boycotts so you think there's you know what women organizing in the 1910s in textile mills in upstate new york there's real like washerwomen in the the south there's like these pockets, but then the sort of broader story of what's been achieved and how do we continue ensuring that working people live with dignity um, and the respect that we all deserve. There's a piece of like the environmental movement and I'm especially sort of fascinated with this idea of how does nuclear power fit within the, the environmental movement? Europe yeah. has taken a much different take on it, I think, than the, the United States. And what does that it's look like? Yeah, it's complicated in Europe. We, we have different, uh, because Europe is not a model, it's not really unified. Like, for example, if you look at France and Germany, which are two countries that I'm pretty aware of, whether there are decisions in regard of energy policy of or taking two radical approaches. Uh, France has traditionally been very heavily invested in nuclear and is going back to it after a, a moment of, of saying that maybe they need to transition out of it, that it's coming back, investment are coming back. Whereas on the other side, Germany, which is the other big country of the EU, has decided that they wouldn't do any nuclear. And on the other side, is just massively investing in coal and, and, and gas just to sustain the, the fact that uh, they don't have enough from renewable energies. So I think that Europe as a whole is, is you cannot, it, it's like all the countries have different approaches. Um, and, and in that way, maybe we don't, benefit from having like a, a common direction where we could actually invest all together, but, but we're not there yet. I mean, you know, yeah. The U.S. has also been lacking a national yeah. 
policy that makes any sense. But there are these like interesting decisions. Yeah. There are these moments of opportunity. There are trade-offs. There are coalition building and then destruction, right? And waste and like, what do you do, right? Like um, all of these questions I think are just ripe for yeah. sort of thinking about how to like, we have to change how we're moving forward, right? Like at the bottom of it, it is about transforming our ec economies and transforming the way that we've you know, heat, it, it, sort of lit our world um, and you know, could, would people want to play? I mean, it's not necessarily a climate change game, but it has to be right. Would people want to play? Right? So I don't know. There's a bunch of stuff. I think people have suggested an equal rights amendment game as a, a follow-up because that's what some of the suffragists got started on immediately. And mm. it has um, famously failed, but people are still trying to sort of actively like, to revive it. What would that look like? So I, like there are so many ideas, but as you can see, they are all in this in this lane of what happens when people come together and what could happen. And yeah. I really hope people think about what can happen, what we can make, what can we can make possible when we get together, um, average everyday people, because we have to. The, the forces of capital and the forces of patriarchy and the forces of racism and white supremacy are such that we don't have the option to not come together. It, it's really on us to be a part of making this the world we want to live in. Yeah, it's really interesting. And and the the U.S. have a very rich history of labor movements, uh, which I think is, I feel sometimes when I speak to Americans, they have no idea about. Uh, and, and, it, and it's a bit frightening, the fact that, you know, uh, the 1st of May comes from your country. It's not a communist thing. It's, it's actually came from the U.S. And it's on the 1st of May. It's not a random day during the month of May. It's the 1st of May. And you need to know why. And, and I th I, but I, I, yeah, there are some the designers, US yeah. Yeah, I think the U.S. is also not as clued into its suffragist history. I yeah. do a lot of searching on Twitter for votes for women these days, and there is an active conversation in the U.K. about what has been made possible by protest, right? As mm -hmm. restrictions on protest are, you know, were passed and are being yeah. debated. Um, you know, people are saying, you know, child labor, votes for women, right? They see this all as a part of their history and a part of what, you know, what people have made possible. Mm. And I just don't see the same kind of conversation take, you know, right? America just sort of like eyes forward, what happens next? And like, if it happened yesterday, it maybe never happened at all. Um, you know, I think partly it's a sort of cultural ethos about like, I don't know, sunshine and puppy dog thinking, but I think it's a real testament to historical gaming that there's an opportunity and a way to reconnect people with a rich history that isn't necessarily front of mind, but you know, it's all this, we can, it's all sort of fertile ground to mine as a designer. But thank you very much for answering all of my questions, Tori. It was great having you. I hope that you'll come back for your next design on, I don't know, labor movement or anything. I would be happy to have you on, uh, on the show again. And yeah, I love votes for women. So if you haven't uh, checked it out, uh, it's pretty cool. It's, as I said, one of my favorite games of last year. So it is pretty cool. And if you've been watching up until the end, thanks for watching the whole video. Remember to like, subscribe, and do all those things to please the algorithms uh, of uh, YouTube. And uh, see you next time. Bye-bye.